that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Amy. Thank you so much, Brooke, and welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. It's a pleasure to be with you. We're going to be talking about mastering that new patient exam. I'm excited to show this with you this evening. We're going to talk about charisma and two factors that actually create charisma. And then we're going to talk about those sections of the exam. And I call that there are five sections of that exam. We're going to go into detail of each one. And then I want to give you another strategy to use as you move through those sections of the exam. And that is using yes inducing questions instead of no inducing questions. So let's jump into charisma, a really fancy word. Actually, there are some key researchers in this space as we talk about some of these terms. Amy Cuddy, Susan Fisk, and Vanessa Van Edwards. Amy Cuddy and Susan Fisk, you will see more in the academia role. And then you'll see Vanessa with a lot of application as she studies human behaviors. And so what are they studying? They are talking about the big two. It's warmth and competence. So th these are two factors that when people are coming across first impressions and making judgments about individuals that keep coming up. And so there's over 50 years of research behind this. One of the big two is warmth. Mm, and people judge that. And as they are, they're looking at the things I've got listed here and more, the friendliness of you, the helpfulness, the sincerity. And basically what they're trying to find out is what are your intentions toward me? You know, what are you thinking about me? What, what are you going to do? Are you a friend or are you a foe? And the other of the big two is competence, mm. skill, ability, creativity, do you have the autonomy to do this? And basically it's answering the question, are you going to be able to enact the intentions that I perceive of you? Ah, so big two, warmth and competence. But here's an interesting thing. How fast do people make evaluations about this? And there's a couple studies that are referenced here and children and adults begin to form these evaluations of warmth and competence after a hundred milliseconds when exposed to a person's face. Wow, that's not much time. Here's the thing, we have to balance these two. It's not an either or. In order to get that respect and that trust, it's a balancing act between the two. And one of the words that Vanessa Van Edwards uses around this is when you can balance warmth with competence, you get charisma. Now, for any of you who have followed me for any length of time, when I teach it, my warmth, I've been calling politeness and the competence I am calling the guiding component. And so my word, when we do that dance between the both of them is you are being respectfully effective. Mm. So let's jump in with warmth and why it's needed. Many research papers and studies show that you should lead with warmth. Given one over the other, lead with warmth. Why? It's a survival instinct. People right away in the evolutionary process want to know friend or foe, are you going to help me or are you going to hurt me? And so they want to know that right away. An interesting thing that I'm going to show you on this next slide is the brain seems to weight warmth information more heavily than competence information. Here's an interesting study that I came across. What they found in here, and this study was done in 2021. It's talking about the prefrontal cortex, where we make intelligent decisions. And what it's saying is the brain, if you will look in the right-hand side, the warmth, the top color chart, compared to the competence chart, when you're looking at the solid lines, what it, they got more of arousal out of the prefrontal cortex when they used warmth sentences and words when compared to competence traits. 
But the other interesting thing about the importance of warmth is there is this thing called re repetition suppression. And I know it's a fancy word and I had to look it up and do some reading on this. And what it means is when our brain gets exposed to the similar thing one after the other, there is a repetition suppression, meaning the brain doesn't light up as much. The interesting thing is when a warmth trait was followed by a competence trait, there was that suppression going on. That's why in those charts that you see there, look at the warmth, the solid red line with the prime. And then the second thing that happened, it really dropped off. That was a competence component. Compared to the chart below, we start with a competence trait and then follow it up with a warmth trait. There is not as much suppression. And what they're saying is, I'm actually going to read it, that when our brain comes across a warmth trait, it's almost like we're inferring things about what comes next. And that inference happens more when warmth comes first. We've already made our decision almost on competence. So it's a fascinating thing to see what's going on. And so we're anticipating those competence things. And so let's lead with that warmth, set a good warm impression, set a smile, set a, a warm welcome, a handshake. And it already is giving you a head start toward that competence. Now that doesn't mean we leave competence by the wayside. We are gonna support what they are learning from that warmth with competence. And competence meaning, are you able to follow through on what I am suspecting you will do with me? And it helps to lower that risk. If you're confident, you can do what you said, and it's competence will actually nudge warmth up or down. So if someone thinks that you are warm, you're friendly, and you come across as competent, it actually makes them think more positively of your warmth and friendliness. Conversely, if your competence is incompetence, it can nudge your warmth down. But I want you to think of your competence supporting your warmth. Because if you think about it, <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt said it well, and it's this is a tributed quotation that Teddy has said, and John Maxwell has really popularized it, said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you actually care. Hmm. Interesting thing. So when we start off, we start off with a smile, not on a braggart about ourselves. I would like you for your treatment coordinators, for your teams to start building your library. And here are four resources I would recommend to you. The top two are by Vanessa Van Edwards. And really she takes these studies and puts them into practical application. Presence Amy Cuddy has done, and then I have been teaching along that polite and guiding component for a number of years. So I would recommend you put those into your library. So how does this influence what we do in our exam? Mm. What I want you to know is, you know, we are a mentor and we are guiding those new patients toward their goal of a great smile. And we're gonna have a planned approach. We're gonna talk about these things, but we have to be willing to adapt. And what that means is I like to talk more about a structure than strict scripts. When I think of this, I, I like to recall that we had somebody in our team that when I was diagnosed with cancer eight years ago, I was working as the treatment coordinator in my husband's office and I had to get somebody up and trained very quickly. And we had a wonderful person named Ashley. She has now moved to another practice because of her family needs uh, several states away. And she now manages several offices for this practice. But her way of learning was, okay, I'm gonna learn this just right. She was taking three by five cards and thinking, what could they say? What's my response? What could they say? What's my response? And as I was role playing with her in the treatment coordinator room, we happened to be in the meet and greet section. We were moving along and I gave her a, a slight humdinger of a question or a scenario. 
And all of a sudden her eyes went big like deer in the headlights. And I could just see her brain racking, going through the three by fives cards in her head and going, oh, I don't know how to answer that. And it was because of that, I was able to say to her, okay, what's the overall goal here? What's the goal for this part of the exam? And right here, I simply want you to get to know them. So she actually helped teach me how to teach others. When we are talking about this exam, we need to have, what is our goal in this part of the exam? What are some tips that we may want to have in our back pocket to pull out? And then how do we transition from one part to the next? So we're going to use that format as we talk about the five sections of the exam. The first one, as you would expect, a meet and greet. Couple goals here. I want you to learn of their objectives. After you have welcomed them in, you've gotten to know them a bit, a few questions about them, I want you to learn about what they want. How would they define success? And during this, you're developing that beginnings of relationship and the beginnings of trust. So how do I do this? Here are a few tips. I want you to listen to learn about them. And so actually I, I heard my husband use this line so many times and I thought, oh, it's great. I think a treatment coordinator would benefit from it. So to a child, if you have a responsible party and a child there, if they're young enough, it's nice to say, well, if I just had this magic wand and I could instantly change anything about your smile, what would it be? Because then we're taking away that whole time and space and you know discomfort and just what is your end goal we're trying to ask it in a way that appeals to them now for an adult i would like you to word it in a different way i would like to learn how would you define success and what would that mean to you and that's when you're going to learn their story because for children and adults they're different motivation a lot of times for a child, it's because, well, it's it's the rites of passage. It's that time of their life. The dentist has said the friends are getting braces. The friends are getting treatment. Maybe there's a social concern. They've been teased. So there's, there's usually something driving that. Whereas for an adult, many times they've gone this far in their life. And for it to be now that they're looking, there's usually an emotional concern that is driving that. So what is it? What is it specifically that would be your goals? And what would that mean for you? Now, sometimes they're going to share it with you in detail, and sometimes they're going to hold that in reservation. I remember one time asking this of an adult, and she said, well, you know, for me, I just want to get my teeth straight. Because see, my brothers got traces when they were young, and I never got to. Now you've got to remain curious and ask the next question because see, in my mind, I was already connecting dots in the best way I knew how I was thinking, wow, if her brothers got treatment and she did not, maybe it's that the family was together. Maybe there was a divorce and there wasn't funds, or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe she was oldest and there wasn't money and financial times came to be better and the brothers got treatment. And when we dug in and asked a few more questions, she said, well, see, my older brother got treatment. My parents got divorced. And so I didn't get treatment. And then each of my parents married again and my younger brother got treatment. And you're like, oh, there was so much emotion to that story. And so this was so important to her. She's like, now, now is the time for me. Mm. So I want you to learn what is success for each of them. And then as we get ready to transition out of this, I want to make sure that you provide agenda, you know, as we're wrapping this section up and say, okay, so what we're going to do today is, and for many of us, that means we're going to take photos and x-rays. The doctor's going to come in. He's going to do a full exam going to use some fancy words and he's going to tell us his recommendations. And then I'm going to walk you through 
your next steps and any finances if treatment's recommended. Now, here's an interesting thing. That agenda, one is, yes, transitioning us, but it's also showing competence of we do have a way we do this in a methodology. But for those who have had my training for a phone and on a new patient call, this is actually an echo of what was said to expect at the new patient exam while they were on the call. And that echo and that repeating of a similar message is like, oh, they do have a process. Oh, they have their act together. It's another cue of competency. So that moves us out of our meet and greet component. As we do, that moves it into the doctor's exam component. The goal here is, and you've got to think that for a doctor's part of the exam, they are doing a miniature warmth and competency assessment. <laughs> and so that means as you walk in, make sure that you do smile, make sure that you do walk in in confidence, make sure if you're talking with the patient and family that you're not hovering over them, you're sitting down. It means that you're going to do your same performance every time that you are in the room. That same performance may look like this. You are actually going to welcome them. You're going to do that exam and review. You may talk across the XYZ planes, the three planes of what we're noticing. And then to get to your goals, we will do this and then make sure you have a good exit. For my treatment coordinators, I want to make sure you don't turn your back on the room. Many of us are actively putting in the doctor's notes into the computer. I am fine with that, except you don't want to give a nonverbal cue of coldness instead of warmth. Don't turn your back on the room. If we have got the doctors with the patient and we've got a responsible party and we've got the treatment coordinator, We've got a nice triangle there. Don't break the triangle by turning your back to the audience, to the rest of the room. And so it can simply mean turning your shoulders 30, 40, 45 degrees so that you don't have the back of your head and the back of your shoulders and your spine to the room. We want to keep demonstrating warmth. For my doctors, that scheduled walkthrough, yes. And for both of you, I'm going to mention it here. Watch out for that devaluing, okay? Okay? You are not speaking like a babysitter to a toddler. You want to go outside? Okay? Okay? No. So what we're going to do is this. Does that sound good to you? You know, if you need to ask a question for clarity or confirmation, ask it. Don't use the questioning and devaluing, okay, as a poor habit. Now, how do we get out of here? Doctors, this is when you're leaving the room. And sometimes I know it can be tricky trying to get out of that room. But what I want to make sure is we're not slinking out of the room. That, that awkward sensation of, and okay, I'm leaving. So have a good leave. It could be a three line exit. We're ready. We'll take great care of you and we'll see you in the clinic. The we is putting us all together. It's making it finalized. We're ready. It lowers the risk. We're going to take great care of you. And it's making the assumption that we're going to see you. You're part of our family. And that allows you to leave. Now, there's times I have coached with various doctors. And even though you're in there for a short period of time, we want to make sure that we are not undercutting the warmth if the competency isn't there. For example, I once had a younger female doctor and for her, she was sometimes slinking out of the room, was in scrubs that looked just like the rest of her team. And she was being mistaken as a team member and not a doctor. And so the transition, walking out of the room, instead of walking down with shoulders hunched over, a little bit of a, like, almost, excuse me, I'm going to walk out sensation. It was pick up your shoulders, back erect. And so the tip that we said is, 
put a little dot above the threshold of your door and I want you to let me know that you actually saw that dot on your way out. That picked up the shoulders, that picked up the head, and now there was greater confidence. Oh my goodness. She not only saw transformation in how she did her exams, but it actually was transforming her life as well as she took these skills into her everyday life. So doctors, you have a big part in here as well. That means we're into this final treatment discussion. Goals here. I want to make sure that there's no more treatment questions or concerns because sometimes they may not ask the doctor. They may ask the treatment coordinator who's there. And another goal is I don't want you getting bogged down in clinical details. You can provide some information, but this is already a lot of information overload. And some of these things are going to be handled clinically. We're going to discuss them when the time is right. So there may be some high points, but don't get bogged down. So some tips around here, and I do have a small way to do this. As we finish asking, have we answered all your treatment questions? I want you to dismiss that child's attention. I want you in a customer service way, be thinking about that parent who may or may not want that child to see the financial implication of this treatment. So an easy way to do this is, as you see here, Johnny, Susie, you've done a great job today and your part is all done. The rest of this information is for mom or dad. So with their permission, you're free to get on your phone or go to the game room, whatever you may have. So it, this is courteous for the parent to be able to go, oh, they know it's finances coming. And they may say, oh yeah, yeah, here's your phone. Or they may say, oh no, I want them to see this, okay? But you've given them that clear indication we're moving forward into that component. And subtly, this is another thing. By you saying it out loud that they have permission to get on their phone, this helps that parent who may want to be making a good impression on you that their kids don't be rude and getting on their phone and you're saying, yeah, go ahead and get on your phone. So it's really relieving some of that potential tension from their perspective. The transition here is that soft dismissal of the child's attention. Now we're ready to go ahead and provide the financial discussion. <laughs> Here's where I want you to be. I want you to help them versus close them here's the thing that you aren't cold calling these people to come in. They have reached out to you. They have expressed interest in you. I want you to be their mentor. They have a goal and you help them get to that goal as opposed to closing them. It's a mental mind shift that I want you to make sure that you have. And one of the other goals is as we get through here, ensure that there aren't any financial barriers that you can't overcome. Uh, so if there is balking in this space, drill down. Is it something with the down payment, something with the monthlies? Is it something overall? Don't be afraid to have discussion here. So here's some tips. I want you to refer to this, yes, as the investment. It is an investment. An investment is something that you're doing so that as you put money in, you get more value out. As you are presenting, and again, especially if you're presenting this to a responsible party for a minor, I want you to point versus read the numbers all out loud. One, again, if we've dismissed the child's attention, we're not saying all those numbers out loud. Secondly, when we start saying all these numbers, it just makes the mind go, oh, TMI, it's just too much for the mind to absorb. A nice way to think of it is with an open palm, point to, so the investment is here, and good numbers you can say out loud. Your insurance is great and it covers 1,500, leaving your out of pocket here. So we're gonna be saying good numbers out loud, pointing to overall numbers. Then, as you have started with the top line, what's the discounts that you may have and or the insurance cover and the out of pocket, what is included is this. And I want you to have three or four points that you may wish to highlight. Most of us have similar things. This covers, I like to say, everything that happens within our walls. 
because that's very easy to distinguish comparative to if an oral surgeon's involved. So everything that's happened in our walls until we get to our solution, one or two sets of retainers, any emergency visits, however you wish to highlight that. Then discuss your payment modalities. And so you can use credit card or a bank account or cash or check, whichever way you do that at 0% interest. And then I want you to walk through three options. Now I know whether you use what's in Ortho 2 Edge or whether you use something outside of Ortho 2, a lot of us have these slider options or electronic options instead of the paper that we use to print out three options. Even if you have a slider option, I want you to pause and demonstrate to them what that would be. And I want you to put a benefit statement with each one. So if you wish to maximize your savings, we do have a pay in full and a 5% or 3%, whatever you have, bringing your out of pocket here. And then we have in-house financing available with a down payment and monthlies. Two examples that I want to show you are our most traditional down payment of this, making monthlies here. And then if you wish to have the greatest flexibility, here's a down payment and monthlies. As soon as you finish the three options, then I want you to go to this transition question. Confirm that something's doable. Which option best fits your budget? Or if you know you're going to send it home with them, I simply want to make sure, is there something here that would fit your budget? If they say, I need to go home and think about it, I completely understand. You don't have to make that choice today. I simply want to make sure that there's something that fits for you. We're trying to overcome any of the money objections. Because sometimes if they say, well, I need to go home and talk to my partner, they may actually speak through their partner's voice. And you say, great, I would do the same thing. Have I at least provided an option that your partner would find doable? They may actually speak through their voice instead of their own voice. So now that we have made sure that something works, we move into our final one. And it's the next steps. It's the making of appointments. And the reason I like to refer to this as next steps, it keeps with that guiding mentality, that mentor mentality, instead of yanking them along, trying to sell them along, trying to get them to sign before they can lose any interest. So I, I want to guide them to a commitment, whether that's the large commitment of starting or the smaller commitment of maybe their follow-up observation or the small less commitment for a follow-up when they've had time to discuss this with a partner. So some tips. I want you to physically turn to your calendar and state, well, our next step is to look for your appointments. And then if the next action appointment is not scheduled, meaning the start or the observation, I want you to use your calendar and say that after a week of enough time to discuss this and do your research, if I haven't heard back from you, I'd like to put a reminder to myself to touch base with you. And then I want you to physically put that on your calendar. We actually use a different column where we put an appointment, a recall appointment for that first follow-up. And you confirm whether they wish to have that follow-up via email, text, phone, whatever it may be, so that when you reach out to them, you're not bothering them. It was actually an agreed upon time frame of when you were going to connect again. So your closure here, you want to thank them for coming in and you're going to confirm that next appointment. And that is whether it's a start or, all right, so if I don't hear from you before next Monday, I'll be reaching out via text. So those are the five sections. And one thing to keep in your mind is instead of them all muddling up together, think of them as buckets you're filling you're completing as you move forward. Because if you move forward before you have completion of the other one, if we don't get to the conclusion we're anticipating, we don't know which variable it was that we tripped up on. 
and or we're adding confusion. Because I have heard many times when I observe exams, we're talking about treatment and then we talk about money and then we hop back to retainers and we're going back and forth. And it's like, whoa, whoa, where are we in the process? So this is a way to help gain clarity as well as keeping things clean as we move forward. Well, one of the things that we use as we move forward, some yes inducing questions. And the reason we have these transition questions as we go from section to section, it one, it helps to ensure that we're even ready to move forward. The transition questions are like a bridge from one section to the next section. And if we ask these in a yes inducing way, it starts to create small promises. Now, why in the world would we want to create small promises? Well, many of you may have heard of Robert Cialdini, another book for your library. I have here Influence, and he talks about the principles of persuasion. We don't have enough time to go into all six of them, but consistency that I have highlighted here in yellow is that small promise component. And what the consistency principle says is people like to be consistent with the things they previously said or done. And so if we get, oh, yes, oh, yes, oh, yes. And when we get to the place that we're asking for the final yes, we've already gotten them into that yes mode as opposed to no, I don't have any more questions. No, I don't have this. No, I don't. And now we're asking them to make a yes. Let me tell you about the study that was done on this consistency principle or persuasion. What they did is they wanted to see about small commitments. They went to neighborhoods. In one neighborhood, they, they went down and they asked them, would you please put this postcard in your window? And they noted how many people put it in their window. Down a few streets over, they did not do the postcard attempt. Then a few weeks later, they came back to those streets and down each street, now they both asked each set of houses, will you please put this sign in your yard? Think about political signs, whatever it was for. Now, will you put the sign in your yard? When it was the small card in the window, there was a 400% increase in that next level of commitment of putting the sign in the yard when compared to the one that we went straight from nothing to sign in the yard. So the little small promise, the little small consistency, yes, I can say yes to a postcard. Then can you say yes to the sign? Eh, sure, why not? I've already said yes once, why not again? As compared to there's only one and done yes for the sign in the yard. So these little yes inducing questions are helping to get little yes, little yes, little yes. How does that play out? You may not use every single one of these, but these are ways of starting to begin to incorporate it. So for an example, in the meet and greet section, after you have talked about what the agenda is, you can ask, does that sound good to you? Yes, it does. Little yes. And then when the doctor is doing the exam, are you happy with how we will meet your goal? Yes. And if they're not, we need to address that. <laughs> now, does this fit your goal? We know we have cleaned that up. When we had the final treatment discussion, treatment coordinators, have I answered all your questions about the plan? Because sometimes they may not ask the doctor directly and they may reveal that question to you or the child may ask you. It's another opportunity. Then in the financial, I alluded to that, have we provided an option that works with your budget? Yes, because if it's a no, we need to pause and fix that. And then maybe at the end is, have I answered your questions about what comes next or about when you come in or how we do our paperwork? These are simply examples. They are not an exhaustive list. And I don't expect you to use every single one every single time, 
but they're tools in your toolbox to be able to use. So let's wrap up here. We talked about charisma, how charisma is that combination of warmth and competence. Charisma is the term that Vanessa Van Edwards uses with it. I like to call it respectfully effective. We talked about the five sections of the exam. And finally, we talked about how to use yes inducing questions as transitions, as bridges moving from one section of an exam to another. Here's what I would call success. This is from another study. The words I love about it. Success is when a patient and their parents think these two things. They get it and they get me. So they get it is a competency and they get me is warmth. And when we do that, they trust us. And that studies say leads to increased willingness to buy, increased admiration and increased brand loyalty. Hmm. Give some of these a try. Let me know how it works for you.